Welcome once again to the Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And I'm Mohammed Tavakoli. <laughs> Mohammed, we're so happy to have you with us here today to have a conversation on the heels of uh, Marjan Satrapi's Persepolis. It is an honor. I'm, I'm looking forward to our conversation. So, born and raised in Tehran, Iran, Mohammed Tavakoli Targi is professor of history and Near and Middle Eastern civilizations at the University of Toronto. He is the editor of the academic journal Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, and he's written two books: Refashioning Iran, Orientalism, Occidentalism, and Nationalist Historiography, and Tajadu di Bumi, or Vernacular Modernity. He's currently working on a book on pathologizing Iran, which explores the intersection of late 19th century political language and the language of medicine. Thank you again for joining us, Mohammed. My honor. So we've just had a conversation, Chris and I, about Satrapi's Persepolis. And one of the things we were talking about is Iranian diasporic writing and wondering about how her work fits into that larger picture of the literature of the Iranian diaspora. Is that a text you've taught in your courses before or have a sense of? I haven't used uh, the book in my courses, but uh, it is a really good introduction to the complexity of Iranian revolution. So for a freshman course, is a really suitable book to read. But I often teach graduate seminars on the Iranian revolution, and I have never thought of using it, but I may find ways of using it in the near future. One of the issues we were wondering about a little bit was when we were comparing Satrapi's work to some of the other diasporic writing that, at least that I've encountered, a lot of it is by women. And we were wondering, is this actually a real feature in the Iranian diaspora that is a predominance of women writers? Or is this a little bit a reflection of Western tastes, Western attitudes, Western publishers in Europe and in North America? Do you have a sense of this? Well, definitely Western taste is really important. But also, this is the signification signals that the rise of Iranian women, both in uh, literature, culture, science, history, not just in diaspora, but also in Iran, many places that historically women were absent, now they are visible. And in a sense, one could argue that there has been a radical transformation in the culture, in the family culture and how women are increasingly become uh, self-confident, assertive, uh, despite the Islamic Republic. There's so much irony in that. You know, I think for many people in the West, there's a perspective that the Islamic Revolution brought a kind of subjugation of women and a relegation of women into the home. And nothing could be farther from the truth in terms of Iranian culture. Uh, the revolution was, in some cases, almost an opportunity for women. I remember, I think it was in a, a volume that was edited by Lila Abu Lugod. You yourself talked about your sister's empowerment in some ways. Uh, right. My, my sister was uh, the very first person Person in our family that wrestled my dad down to the ground. So, but but we also see this in many other realms of everyday life, both in diaspora and I think uh, Iranian uh, uh, women have become very visible in the academy, in uh, science, in politics, and also, as I said, in Iran. Well, one of the other things we were wondering about when we were reading Satrapi's Persepolis was what kinds of uh, role was not only gender, but also class playing in the perspective she was taking on the revolution. And even just from the book itself, you get a sense of her Tehran is a very particular kind of Tehran. And then her life in diaspora is also got all kinds of class markers associated with it. Can you talk a little bit about that spectrum of experience and how variable people's experience of revolution was and, and of the diaspora is in terms of class? I have some sense of it, but it's very secondhand, very mediated. Uh, definitely Satrapi uh, positions herself as part of uh, Bajar family, royal family, and her family is uh, part of the elite. Uh, we don't know what her parents were doing, but her grandfather supposedly was a prime minister. That class division in Iran 
which was part of the pre-revolutionary period, has also intensified in the post-revolutionary period. That is, the Iranian revolution promised to close the gap, create social equality, but actually it has intensified it. But I would also say that her analysis, her Marxian analysis, while she identifies herself uh, with dialectical materialism and Marx and God have the same, same status, but the kind of Marxism that she talks about is also very elitist Marxism, that there are a variety of other Iranian political sort of left that does not come out in the novel. But nonetheless, what is really important to understand in the pre-revolutionary period that people were revolutionaries, were inspired by Marxism, regardless of whether they were Islamist or they were Marxist-Leninist, they were inspired by the promise of closing the social gap. And one could argue that the dialectical materialism that we see in Persopolis is also in Iranian Islamist political writing. That's interesting. How widespread do you think was Marxist thought before and then after the revolution? Iranian Islamism the brand that became hegemonic in 1979 really emerged in a dialogical encounter and and as a response to the rise of Marxism in 1940s. Therefore, to encounter Marxism and uh, communist-oriented Iranian political forces, Iranian Islamists had to become familiar with Marxism and create alternative responses to it. And thus, if you read Iranian Islamic writing just as fundamentalists, one cannot understand the complexity of the political discourse that we identify as Islamism. But if you put it in a dialogic relationship, dialogue-like relationship with Marxism, which became a really viable political force in the 1940s, then one understands how various categories, how Islam was reshaped and we have the emergence of a political Islam that becomes then competitor of Marxism and socialism. It's so fascinating the ways in which you bring out the spectrum of forms of leftism that there was in the years leading up to the revolution and the extent to which there were secular positions and also Islamist positions. Because again, the common perception, I think, by a lot of people in in North America is that there's a kind of traditionalism, a kind of return of quote-unquote medieval forms of religion and so on that are what's going on in the time of the revolution. But these are actually very profound, up-to-the-moment 20th century intellectual and political movements that are taking place. Definitely. If if they were medieval, they would have been more of a spiritual, mystical kind of Islam focusing on worship and not on politics. So the politicization of Islam is really a project of modernity. Iranian modernity of the 19th century and 20th century turns increasingly Islam into a viable political force, and it becomes viable political force because it is in dialogue with nationalism, various kind of political liberalism, and uh, the various forms of leftist political ideologies and political forces. Before we turn to talking a little bit more about literature and maybe literature of the Iranian diaspora and also the kinds of literature Iranian people in Iran are reading today, I I want to ask one more question that arises from the sort of political issues that you've been drawing out for us. We talked before about the kind of class hierarchy that emerges in Satrapi's Persepolis and the ways in which those class divisions are expressed and even maybe to some extent magnified in the Iranian diaspora. What happens to those class structures within Iran in the decades after the revolution? Uh, Is the hierarchy still there or is it changed in some important ways? Well, uh, uh, hierarchies uh, in some instances have become really intensified. Iran is much more class divided at a certain level today than it was in the pre-revolutionary period. 
and those who are in the position of power, they have access to industrial uh, uh, sort of resources that the rest of the Iranian population doesn't have. In a sense, one could argue that the Iranian revolution has led to the shrinking of the Iranian middle class. And then because of the post-revolutionary period and the development having leading to confiscation of property and, and monopoly in various uh, industries, uh, the people who have been in favorable position in post-revolutionary Iran have become much richer than their counterparts who were close to the Shah. There's a lot of hardship there. One one point that I wanted uh, to raise is that uh, uh, Satrapi very effectively shows how in the post-revolutionary period, private life in Iran became transformed. And we have her mother, you know, uh, posting the curtains and creating the kind of space that is protected. I think while this is more metaphorical and simple sort of explanation, one could argue that since the Iranian revolution, private space, family space, has become the site of creating an alternative public that is the culture that at one time was in public in the post-revolutionary period because of the limitations of imposed by the Islamic revolution went home. Mm. And with the media and uh, increasingly the Iran with digital technology, the access of Iranians at home to global development became actually much more intensified. And thus, while the Iranians who are raised in family, the the, the family networks have become increasingly more important, but the kind of ethos that they have is very different from the ethos of Iranians of the pre-revolutionary period. Hmm. Satrapi, for example, like many other Iranians of the pre-revolutionary period, their ego ideal was prophet. They wanted to become the new prophet, you know, which indicates that there was a form of religiosity that shaped their political imagination or self-projection. I think that has shifted. In a sense, the private space in Iran has become increasingly, if not secularized, it has become intensely profane in the Marxian sense, and it has become disworldly. And the Iranians of the post-revolutionary generation are probably the most secular of not only Iranians, I would dare to say the most secular of their contemporaries worldwide. That's extraordinary and so fascinating, too, placing that against the ways in which Satrapi talks about the family. I mean, she's talking about her own family in very specific terms, but also you get a real sense that she's on the one hand speaking for herself as an individual subject, but also speaking for her family, a kind of a vessel for her family memory. Um, That's very different from the family environments. They turn inward into the family that you're describing, but there may be some common ground there, too. Yeah, the, the the family networks that could expand and be inclusive of your neighbors and the social gatherings, the parties that they have, all of these are indication of a cultural ethos that is emerging within the Islamic Republic that transcends it. And one other advantage that the new post-revolutionary Iranian generation has is that unlike the pre-revolutionary generations whose knowledge of Islam was very limited, because of the compulsory inclusion of religious education at all levels in elementary school, high school, uh, university, many Iranians feel they know as much as the clerics about Islam. Thus, they don't need them to tell them what to do. 
That's fascinating. You've been telling us a little bit about um, Iranians living in Iran after the revolution. And we've been talking also a little bit about the diaspora. And one of the things people say about diasporic cultures is that while there's a certain amount of common ground and a sense of strong relationship between those at home and those in the diaspora, there are also certain features that get magnified in strange ways within diasporic culture, certain cultural things, um, the arts, music, cuisine takes on a certain kind of cultural power. A sense of the nation and national identity takes on a certain character in the diaspora that's very different from what you see in the homeland. I'm wondering where literature fits into that landscape. What kinds of literature is popular in the Iranian diaspora? What kind of literature is popular at home? Uh, Can you talk a little bit about that or open that up a little bit for our listeners? Well, um, generally, Iranian diaspora communities that I know, first of all, they're highly diverse. Iranian community of Toronto is not similar to Los Angeles, and the Iranian diaspora community of Toronto is highly diverse, and it depends on when they came, when they left Iran, and what did they have when they came here. There there are Iranians of pre-revolutionary period, uh, both in the United States and in Canada and also in Europe, they are different from the first generation of people who came to exile, who were largely Iranian leftists with political orientation to the left. And increasingly, the new wave, it's different. And when an Iranian a pre-revolutionary period or the first generation of Iranians after the revolution talk about Iran is radically different from the Iranians who have recently returned from Iran or they came to Iran in 20 teens. No, thank you for reminding us about that diversity, both in terms of geography and in terms of time. My in-laws had immigrated um, in 1959, and I remember way back when, this must have been in the late 80s or something, being really struck by the uh, gap between their perspectives on political and social issues and those of other Iranian people I knew who had come in later years. So there was so much variety. And, And in fact, many of the Iranians of the diasporic community that have come in the later decades, particularly the first wave of Iranian immigrants in 1980s, they have highly nostalgic conception of Iran. And they have a conception of Iran that has become sort of the lost utopia. They uh, present the Iranian revolution as something totally disastrous that destroyed something that was brilliant and and it was the best moment of Iranian history. You even have Iranian leftists who have now turned radical right, who increasingly idealize the pre-Islamic, pre-revolutionary. Iran. So because of their diversity, they read different literature. One cannot say that uh, Iranian diasporic communities worldwide read the same kind of things. They have different tastes and their taste is uh, determined not only with with the kind of profession that they are engaged in, but also when they left Iran and to what extent they they remained in Iran in the post-revolutionary period. But I could say that There is wide readership, for example, in history. Uh, There are a lot of Iranian women novelists inside Iran writing, and they have been for uh, more than a couple of decades, three decades, they have been bestsellers in Iran. So we see the rise of Iranian women within the diaspora, but there are also Iranian novelists, poets, writers, film producers, Iranian women artists, Mm -hmm in Iran that are as accomplished and as widely recognized as their compatriots outside of Iran. I'm curious if there's been a lot of translation of Iranian novels, for example, that have been put forward for an audience outside of Iran, and if they're being read mostly by people from the diaspora or if they're reaching a wider audience. I'm not familiar with the many translations, and partly because the texts that are written in Iran, they have an Iranian audience in mind. And the way they talk about things are very different from Iranian diasporic novelistic writing that they have a 
North American or European audience in mind. And, and in a sense, what really distinguishes the Iranian diasporic community from the Iranian authors living in Iran is who are they writing for? As uh, Majan Satrapi says, uh, she's writing to correct some of the stereotypes about Iranians. So the audience is not an Iranian audience, it's a North American European audience, originally uh, published in French, thus starts with a French audience and then increasingly has become more global, whereas Iranians are addressing their compatriots who are living in Iran, have, have shared the same kind of kind of ex- experience. Here you have really elementary outlines of political, social life, and Majan Satrapi is very worried that she, she's getting too complicated and her readers may not follow her. So it's highly simplified. And and we have an outline of the Iranian revolution, but not the complexity of the Iranian revolution. The veil is very important, but again, this is a symbol more important outside of Iran rather than inside Iran. Yeah, we when we were talking about the work, Chris and I were really aware of how idiosyncratic and personal and subjective her take on the revolution was, and in many ways also uh, self-consciously a, a child's perspective on it. Yeah. I, I, of course, that child perspective is really great for educating people about the basic outlines of Iranian life and how how the revolution transformed things. It's it's interesting, and I really appreciate that it shows the complexity of both ideological in the pre-revolutionary period. Both she's Marxist, she adores Marx, but also God. And she wants to be a prophet and she wants to become a revolutionary. And her own family, likewise, is is more complex. And also what I think is important, while stereotyping Iranian women as veiled, but it also is stereotype busting in a way that it shows that people who are under the, wearing the hijab are very complex and they have individuality, personality, and they are not sort of undifferentiated mass. Yeah, one of the things we were struck by was the ways in which she's very critical, obviously, of the clerical class at large, but there's also a real, not only a real piety that she also expresses at certain moments, but then also when she encounters uh, the one particular uh, administrator responsible for verifying her religious education, he's someone she describes as a, a truly religious man. Like, So there's a space for piety, sincerity in religion and so on, even while there's this critique of the clerical class is happening there. Yeah, and 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 that is really, in a sense, people who are working on uh, Iranian history, culture, uh, see the kind of re- religious duplicity that has become hegemonic in the post-revolutionary period, and they radically differentiate it with the kind of the spirituality that is identified with uh, Rumi, with Hafiz, with Saadi, this. Uh, uh, great Iranian mystical poets. And that kind of spirituality had become hegemonic in Iran in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s on the eve of the Iranian revolution. If you wanted to sort of see what really bound Iranian together, like Marjan, is that it's a kind of a spiritual Islam that was not reducible to religious laws that are imposed in the post-revolutionary period. That's so fascinating because that's one of the features I wondered about a lot. Like, what is the place of those spiritual writers like Rumi, like Hafez, and so on, that loom so large in the Western imagination when they think about Iranian history and culture and literature, and clearly also inhabit a very important part of Iranian self-imaginings. And as you were saying, especially in the 1950s, what's the place of those figures now, both within the diaspora and within uh, Iranian culture in Iran? Well, in fact, with the Islamic revolution and the experience of clerical Islam, people have increasingly turned to this mystical Islam, which is 
very different from the mystical orientation of the pre-revolutionary period. Now is a very intentional post-political spirituality and a kind of a spirituality that has transcended political Islam and clerical Islam. So then they look into universal brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, universality becomes really important, respecting human beings, regardless of the religious, ethnic, and political orientation becomes uh, more important. And one could say that the post-political experience in Iran goes back to a kind of, one could say, medieval spirituality and fills it with a content that is cosmopolitan and universal. That's absolutely fascinating. I would love to talk about that more if we do uh, an episode on Persian poetry. I thought we might do the Shahnameh at some point, but maybe if there's a chance to do translations of Hafez or Rumi, that would be a really great opportunity. That would be great. We're in such a curious moment now in so many different ways. Obviously, we're all living uh, through a time of pandemic and thinking about our loved ones here, our loved ones elsewhere in the world, uh, mindful of how people are suffering in Iran right now. Um, but also we're um, at a time when we've just passed the uh, Nowruz, the Iranian New Year has just come, and we're before Siz Dabidar, which is the 13th day of the New Year. So we're kind of in that in-between time. And uh, we published our Persepolis episode to coincide with Nowruz. I'm wondering if this is something you celebrate in your household still? I North do, America? and actually I have a half scene right in front of me. And uh, Nowruz was also the most important celebration in our family from my earliest childhood experience. And uh, families would come together and we would all, almost always go to visit the elder of the family and then from there go to the uncles and then closer relatives and all in sort of age hierarchy. The older you were, the first visits would be would be to them. So it's a it's a very important period and, and it's a period of also romanticism because the spring comes, the winter ends and all the sorrows and pains go away and then you have a promise of new beginning. Unfortunately, this year with coronavirus, that optimism of the spring has been highly compromised. It has been compromised in Iran, but also worldwide. Iranians are suffering even more because of the embargo and intensified embargo that the United States has uh, imposed on Iran. And Trump administration is trying to bring Iran to its knees. But if, if they knew, if the administration knew a little bit about Iranian politics, they would know that that's not the way to go. Yeah, it's heartbreaking, the level of suffering that's coming from the pandemic and then exacerbated, exactly as you say, by the political behaviors, just making it more and more and more untenable. You know, you were talking so movingly about those visits to the family, um, beginning with the eldest relatives and moving on down. This year has been particularly difficult for Iranians in the, the diaspora and also at home, having to make those uh, visits be instead phone calls or Skype calls or something like that. And, you know, the half scene gathering around the table, you normally you have your, your family there. For our family, we we're all celebrating in different places. So my second daughter, Sarah, she's all by herself up in Toronto, but she made a little half scene. My oldest daughter, Yasin, up in Boston, also made one for her and her husband and then others of us here. So we were separate, but we were all through social media. We were sharing our pictures. We were FaceTiming. And so apart but together. And so it's it's such a strange New Year environment for us. It is. And, and in fact, one could see that uh, the major sort of content of Nuru celebration is social de-distancing. If uh, you haven't been in contact with your family, with relatives, get in touch with them, go see them, go visit them. If you have broken up <laughs> and you no longer talk, the Nowruz would be the good time to go and socialize and rebuild friendships. And unfortunately, with, with social 
distancing that we all must obey this year, celebrating the rules has become especially difficult. And, and of course, Skype, FaceTime, and there are a whole lot of other digital uh, possibilities of contacting relatives, but that face-to-face um, uh, contact has to wait for next no rules. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You know, I'm reminded of a friend who was saying in conversation the other day that because of the social distancing, because of being physically isolated one from the other, she's finding herself writing emails and writing letters to people she hasn't been in touch with for a long time. So it could be that in some ways that renewal is happening, but in unexpected ways. I, I hope that we come out in a, in a better place at the end of this hard time. Were there any moments, any scenes, any any little details in Persepolis which really brought an aspect of Iran back to you that you hadn't thought about in ages? Well, Persepolis, um, it's a really loaded concept for Iranians, and it has become highly emotive in the post revolutionary period. She makes references to the uh, 2500 anniversary celebration in Iran that uh, the Shah staged and brought all heads of states uh, to Iran, uh, which happened in October uh, 1971. But the celebration of the the 2500 anniversary at Persopolis, at the tomb of Cyrus the Great, it has also other significances. And part of this, what we were talking about, the emergence of this universal spirituality of the pre-revolutionary period, in fact, it had to do with Iranian lawyers in 1940s coming to conclude that the only way that Iran could preserve its national integrity because of its ethnic differences, religious diversity, and uh, all cultural, ethnic, linguistic diversity is by focusing on equality rights, which was an important article of the Iranian constitution of 1906. And in order to make the equality rights intensely Iranian, they linked it to Cyrus the Great. And the Cyrus Cylinder became really important. So the investment the Pahlavi regime, the Shah's regime, made on making Persepolis even grander than it was, it was linked to this political project of focusing on equality rights, equality rights in a way that Iranian Muslims and non-Muslims, Iranian Persians and Baluchis and Kurds and Turks are equal, particularly uh, th- that religious difference. The Iranian Baha'is, for example, had been increasingly marginalized in the early decades of the 20th century. And Iranian lawyers came to conclude that the only way that you can do this is focus on equality rights and thus make Cyrus the Great even greater and more pertinent to everyday life in Iran. And uh, thus, for me, as a historian who has focused on this, Persopolis has this multiple meaning. And in the post-revolutionary period, increasingly, the birthday of Cyrus has become a great new day to celebrate. So something that my generation of the pre-revolutionary period didn't know anything about, now it has become a moment of celebration and people often go to the tomb of Cyrus and Persepolis to to visit and 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 it one could say Cyrus's tomb has become like a Muslim shrine <laughs> for Iranian nationalists who want to to focus on their uh, pre-Islamic uh, culture and heritage. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, I'd love to know more about that. Do you write about that in your Refashioning Iran book? or No, th- th- this is a project that I have. It's a notion of equality and governmentality, that why the Iranian lawyers beginning in 1940s became increasingly forced 
uh, the, the, the Shah and others to recognize that equality must become important and why the pre-Islamic Iran was then intensely linked to Islam. Some of the arguments that these lawyers made was that rather than having a divide between pre-Islamic and Islamic, the philosophy of equality that was promoted by Cyrus continues into the best of the Persian literature by focusing on on universality, humanity, equality of all individuals to, to one another. And the pain of one is the pain of the other. Wow. Yeah. So so that that's the kind of a spirituality that was dominant in the pre-revolutionary period that linked very easily with with sort of cosmopolitan conceptions of Marxism and other, you know, political ideologies of the time. And that became a springboard for for the Iranian clerics because people had had developed a very positive conception of religion. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? Just one point that I wanted to raise is that uh, the, the graphic novel, yeah, I was just going to ask about that, you know, this question of, you know, Persian poetry on the one hand that's so oral, so oriented toward the meter and the rhyme and so on, as opposed to the graphic. I, I have a huge collection of Persian newspapers going back to late 19th century. And what is really impressive is how sort of graphic design and cartoons are an important part of Persian newspaper art. So in a sense, the kind of depictions that you see in Satrapi are not sort of a Western influence. You can see them, and uh, and also because of her, uh, her uh, sort of art education uh, in Iran, uh, is that Iranian newspapers, particularly illustrated uh, newspapers, particularly satirical journals, had many pages of illustrations and they told the stories through cartoons. And actually, one book that I'm working on is caricaturizing Mossadegh. That's a title for the book. And, and I focus on cartoons of Mossadegh in 1950s to 1953 when he was overthrown. And there are immense numbers of cartoons of, of, of the political conflict in Iran. Thus, uh, the, the, the graphic design, there is a long history of graphic design in Iran that has shaped also her artwork beside her text. That's really interesting. I hope, I hope we can find some examples online perhaps of of some of those graphic designs so that we can show people. I could send you some. And also there was this um, children's Kehan, it's called Kehan Bachoha, had illustrated sort of stories and pages that were in cartoon. And I'm certain that she has been also influenced by that. Actually, I noticed in one of the comic blocks in Persepolis, it's actually Kehan is the journal. So. Right, right. Kehan Bachoha was the children's Kehan. Uh, was very popular, and uh, I, I myself used to read the, the, the cartoons there and and the, the graphic visuals that they had, graphic stories that they had. Oh, that's fantastic! I'm, I'm super curious about what they what the style looks like there. Well, I think that's about all the time we have for today. But this has been a really fascinating discussion. And thank you very much for sharing all this with us. Yeah, thank you so much, Mohammed. This has been so fascinating. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I really enjoyed it and I look forward to further conversations with you. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. Show notes with links for things that we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 26b. And the Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time, see you again at the Spouter Inn.